Good morning. In this me lecture, I'm going to introduce Jupyter Lab and Jupyter Notebooks. It's a very important tool in any scientific programming pipeline in Python today. So the overview of the of the mini lecture is as follows: We're going to get Jupyter Lab up and running uh, within the VX Uni environment that we've built in the previous mini lectures. We're going to talk about the nature and role of Jupyter Notebooks and Jupyter Lab, and then we'll do some simple data loading, uh, data exploration, and then a simple chart, and then something a little bit more complicated overlaying latitude long longitude data on a leaflet.js map. Uh, and very importantly, we'll end by talking about the drawbacks of Jupyter Notebooks. I think it's quite important uh, these days to also think about that for a bit. Um, I would also like to uh, henceforth uh, list the learning goals of each mini lecture. So in this case, uh, after following this lecture, you'll be able to explain uh, what Jupyter Not Notebooks are. You'll be able to explain the risks of Jupyter Notebooks and you'll be able to get your own Jupyter Lab uh, up and running, load notebooks, create notebooks, and do simple data wrangling if uh, you are not able to do so already. Okay, so the prerequisites of uh, this mini lecture are that you have a working Miniconda 3 um, installation. That's the most important thing. So let's get started. These notes will be made available uh, afterwards on the lecture page. Let's go to my terminal over here. Right, so we already have, oh no wait, we don't, or we don't have to. But we have an environment at YML. This is in a GitHub repo. Uh, that GitHub rep uh, repository I will also put on the show notes or on the lecture notes. There we go. So on GitHub, I created an organization called VXUni. And within there, I will create repos for each of these mini lectures. And in this specific repo called Jupyter Running, uh, you can just uh, clone this and then follow along. Uh, this uh, instructions to clone and to and to get up and running are in the notes. Okay, but I'm just going to do it like this Right, so I've already have a checkout. It's my main checkout over here and then uh, There's an environment.yml. So that's what I'm going to use to set up my uh, my Kana environment to, to update it in any case So let's just act activate it first fix uni Kana and update Remember that Conda Inf update is this uh, this magic invocation which will create an environment only if necessary. But if you already have an environment with that name, VXUni in this case, which is specified here at the top, it will only make sure that your environment has all the packages required by uh, by this one. Let's just give it some time over there to crunch. Now oh, we can go through the through the um, dependencies quickly. Oh, too late. You'll see one uh, uh, interesting change is that I've added the Conda Forge channel uh, to the channel. So it's not only looking in the default places for Conda package, it's also in Conda Forge, um, where we have many uh, uh, development versions of many of these packages. And this is because I needed base map of uh, a, a version bigger or equal or uh, equal to or bigger than 1.1. Folium is what we what we ended up using to draw maps. Python as per usual. Jupyter Lab is the tool we're actually going to talk about most of the time. Matplotlib is for plotting. Pandas is an amazing package for uh, loading and wrangling data. Uh, Pillow is, is an image processing library required by Basemap. Seaborn helps uh, or gives us, uh, sort of, let's say, a, a more um, modern API over Matplotlib and also uh, it significantly improves its appearance. And then Activity.io is the additional pip package that I needed to load uh, fit data that uh, I save from my fitness device. So I'll be looking at one of my runs, but you can use this for, for any of your .fit data. This is the data format, I think it's by Garmin, uh, but many other devices also are able to generate this format. Okay, so now I have my um, environment active. I have all the packages installed, and now I can just type Jupyter Lab. Let's just make sure that the browser it starts will be in this frame, Jupyter Lab. So what happened there is uh, is that you'll see all of the startup ma messages of Jupyter Lab, and then it ended by starting my browser, and then pointing my browser at this endpoint, or at least sorry, this is the the the, the kind of the web server that Jupyter Lab exposes, and that's the token I need to get in. Let's see what happens. And what you can also see here is that my notebook is already open. In your case, I don't know. You might see the launcher like this. In which case you just have to double click on the notebook in this left in this file tab okay so just some uh, some tips over here 
uh, I find in Jupyter Lab and in Jupyter Notebook something which works quite well is just uh, remembering the shortcut key for the command palette. So I can go in. This is Jupyter Lab, so I just go in my case Command Shift C, and then over here I can uh, type something and see. Oh well, to insert a cell above is A, or to insert a cell below is B. And this copy and paste. This is how I can learn how to use this um, uh, this tool more effectively. Right. Okay. So um, the other thing is, but we'll talk about that a bit more later, is that I th it's a very good idea to keep as much as possible of your Python code in a separate Python file or separate Python files even, and to keep it nicely documented over there. The reason for that is that you can then use your Python IDE to edit that code. So the, although the Jupyter Lab and the previous Jupyter Notebook offer considerable uh, code completion and documentation facilities, it's still not quite on the level of a full IDE such as PyCharm, um, and we'll have to see if it ever gets there. Um, but for that reason, and also for the reason that uh, it makes it easier for you to structure your code, to test your code, and to, to version control, it's a good idea to uh, try continuously to extract as much as possible Python code out of the notebook into uh, an external Python file, and then just to import that file. And I'll show you a trick here, which we we'll look at that right now, how you can facilitate that process. So what I usually do is um, I load this extension called auto reload, and then I set its mode to, to one, right? So what this means is that all modules that I specify to be auto reloading will be reloaded before every cell execution. What that means in practice is that I can have an external file. I'll show you that right now before we go back to YouTube. So I have an external file called jrcommon.py, which you can also see here. It lives there. In this case, it lives right in the same directory as my Python notebook. And this magic A import, which stands for auto import JR common, will import that file and also indica indicate to the auto reloading system that this is one of the modules that should be auto reloaded at every um, uh, at every cell execution. And then over here, because in Python, obviously, imp you know, importing unless I have some auto reloading go going is usually idempotent. So it will uh, just you know use the same module instance if that has already been loaded. Um, I use that to just rename or to create uh, something new in my namespace called JR instead of JR common. And just to show you what that file looks like, let me just do that while I'm here. So I have my uh, PyCharm community I have open over here, and here you can see the file JR common. So this is my this is the normal way I do it, uh, and it's not yet. Um, uh, this is the normal way I do it. I have a, a, a let's say a, a a common file, a common.py file with, this is the first stage where I factor code out into. Um, and then as the code matures or, or uh, when I decide, you know, this code needs to be structured better or it actually needs to go in a library, it can go from here. But the huge advantage over here is that um, I get all of these uh, PyCharm niceties um, and completion and code and understanding. And for me also very importantly is that PyCharm um, there are other tools for doing this. Um, it will also do uh, type checking. So since Python 3.5, I have these uh, type annotations which are now built into the language and I can specify types. Down here, for example, you can see that I've even uh, gone and specified a local variables type uh, because um, in, this, in this Python uh, module over here, this is loaded from a JSON file. So PyCharm can't figure out what that is. But by helping it here, um, it now knows that CM is a linear color map and it can help me understand that, um, that object better. So this is uh, this sort of thing you can't do in the notebook yet. And we'll see, we'll see what happens in time. Okay, so there was a bit of fun. So I call this notebook Jupiter Running because I uh, sort of remembered that um, uh, there was a movie called Jupiter Rising but it seems I was confused. The movie is called Jupiter Sending, which I also have not seen, but there was a band called Jupiter Rising. Um, and I looked it up, they were quite big on MySpace. And just because, well, this is a learning moment, I wanted to show you that you can embed any uh, YouTube video in your IPython notebook. There might be some serious work or research reasons for doing this. And then 
you know, you can uh, see what, uh, what Jupiter Rising sounds like. I don't think you can hear that, but you should try it in the notebook on, on GitHub. Okay, I think that at least uh, we've got the notebook started. So what you so what you can see here, and we'll get back to that in the in the rest of the mini lecture, is that a notebook combines, in this case, it combines bits of markdown, and then we have bits of code, and we can execute the code. In the markdown, we can have, as you can see here, some typesetting. We can even uh, include math via MathJax, so we can get really really beautifully typeset uh, mathematical formulas. So in this case, in this way, we can build up an old document. Um, let's just see where we are now. Okay, so we've got the old Jupyter Lab going. Right. Okay, so maybe um, I will just. Okay, I think that's a, that's a good enough introduction. I think we need to get back to the discussion a little bit, and then we'll we'll come back in a few minutes, and we'll uh, load my fit file, this uh, this uh, Garmin um, uh, activity file. Okay. So, what are Jupyter notebooks? As you saw now. It's a, it's a web-based tool, but I think more importantly is that they're fundamentally a, a, a sort of a, a, a live document. It's, it's, a, it's a real practical example of literate programming where you can intersperse documentation, runnable code, the results of that code, tables. So it's actually a wonderful way of documenting a process or documenting a, a computational process where you load data, you analyze the data, you make charts, you do statistical analyses, and you come to certain conclusions. And they're great for uh, documenting that process. They're also great for sharing because they can be viewed online. Um, and what they're also great for is somebody else can download your notebook. And if you've specified your environment correctly, they can you know, rerun your whole notebook and see uh, the results of your analysis the same way that, that you did. Um, there's a, I'll put a link in the, in the lecture notes. There's a, a gallery or a whole list of interesting Jupyter notebooks maintained by the Jupyter people. And it's quite impressive uh, to go through there. Just to show you what this looks like on uh, GitHub, but you've probably seen this before, is if you open a notebook on GitHub, and that's a static file, it's not, it's not nobody, you know, you're gonna, it's only for viewing, but uh, viewers can actually see the typeset version of your notebook for the largest part. So they can see this table, some something, or they can even see this chart. So not everything comes through. So for example, the leaflet maps are quite dependent on JavaScript, uh, specific JavaScript, so that's not, that's not showing. But there's at least somebody could go through here and get a very good idea of, of, uh, of your experiment, which is uh, really nice. Okay. So Jupyter Lab, um, it's um, a new version, or let's say it's a, it's a rewrite, if I understand correctly, of uh, Jupyter Notebook. So we used to use a software also called Jupyter Notebook, and that was also a web-based version. I can actually show you that because Jupyter Lab also has a notebook server. Let's try that. So this is the lab server, but if I go to this exact same URL, let's see that's called localhost lab. Let's just copy that and then go to notebooks. And then I get the old school notebook server. This is what Jupyter Notebooks or Jupyter Notebook looked like. So I can open that same notebook. It looks like it's even using the same kernel. So it just was a bit different. What lab brings to the table um, it has a number of, of more viewers and it has incredibly convenient uh, tools such as the, this one where I can open a console that's attached to the same Python kernel as the notebook, which is amazing if I want to do some quick calculations. Let's just have a look here. I think it should... Yes. So what you see here is that I did an import JR common as JR over here, and that same import is available on this side. So I can use this and I, I can uh, um, set constants, I can do small calculations, and then remember the hotkey for opening a cell above, it was A, so I press A, and then press enter, and now I can just press A, and then execute that with control enter, and you'll see the value is 42, and this is what I set down here in the console, which is really convenient. Besides that, Jupyter Lab also has uh, the facility of tiling these um, these notebooks. I don't think I did that right. Wait, let me see if I can do it again. Uh, that's a move. Hmm. 
no i'm doing it i'm not i'm clearly i'm doing um it is possible to have the same notebook open twice and then have them adjacent but i think i have now forgotten the magic invocation to do so okay i'll try and add that in the in the in the lecture notes in any case um so jupiter lab is still in beta at this moment but it's i would yeah I've, i'm cautiously starting to use it for all my own projects because what's also well besides that you know the attached console um you can it also understands a whole bunch of different data files that you can open directly and it will it will know how to view them which is pretty convenient okay let's see what's uh, here still uh, i think yeah we can actually continue with the whole demo so uh, we've imported jr okay so what's happened here is um, I have a .fit file which came through Apple Health and which I then exported using an app called HealthFit. So HealthFit uh, takes that health, that health data from Apple and then it generates .fit files and, and push it, puts them in, into your Dropbox or, or iCloud or whatever. But this .fit file you should be able to export from any other fitness device. And then uh, I found that package. The package called activity io and then i wrote this small function over here well there's the file i'm using the the new style uh, path object this is just on my desktop i'll probably make this file available to members of of the site i would not want to put this uh, uh, publicly but you can use any other fit file and then i wrote a little function over here load fit file that uh, takes no parameters but it simply loads that file and returns the data frame and the data frame is an amazing data structure that uh, uh, pandas um, it was inspired by by r and this data frame is just a it's kind of a high level abstraction over this sort of data so you can see over here i have a time index and at each time point here it's per second i have a bunch of well i have a number of columns so i have these variables available and i can index this in all weird and wonderful ways so I can, for example, say, well, just uh, give me the HR data. And there's the HR data. So it starts with not. That's when the watch is still getting, a, I guess it's getting a lock on my arm or something. It's an optical heart rate sensor. And then later on, it kicks in. Remember, these optical sensors are not very, are not very uh, accurate, but OK, they're better than, uh, than not having anything. OK, and then what's interesting here is I have latitude and longitudinal data. I have speed data. Um, and I also have distance, uh, distance in meters and also my running cadence, which is the one I'm interested in. Okay, so what I usually do is you load or you get a data frame and just to have a look at kind of what the structure is, you do a dot head that will just show you the names of the columns and it will show you, um, it'll show you it's a sample of the lines, not the whole file. I can ask Jupyter to show me the whole file, in which case it will neatly truncate it somewhere in the middle and then continue on. It's really nice that when you can see it also does a sort of a pretty print. Um, I think I can also do this. Yes, I can. So now I've uh, asked Panos to describe this data frame. Shift tab gives you this sort of help, which is pretty cool. If you keep on pressing shift tab, it will eventually, well, sorry, no, it won't. that's in the notebook. Forget what I said. Shift tab just will show you this. If it's in the notebook, it will eventually embed it in your interface. Okay, but what it's, it's giving me a bunch of, of basic statistics, statistics over each of these columns. I've got the min, max, standard deviation, and my quartiles, and it helps me to you know, get a quick glance at my data. Okay, then I'm going to configure matplotlib because I want to plot. So I'm importing matplotlib pyplot as plt. That's the, the API that I used to talk to it. These are all, con you'll see these conventions quite often. We usually import pandas as pd, and numpy as np, and seaborn as sns. You'll see this everywhere. Then uh, Seaborn brings a whole bunch of styles to the table. So these are the list of styles which I show here by going display plot style available. Uh, display is an IPython term for do, you know, pretty printing. So where in Python 3, the print function will simply print text. Display will, for example, um, do this very nice um, display of the of the data frame or HTML or whatnot. Why displays? So usually in in a, a Jupyter uh, Jupyter notebook in a cell, it's conventional that I end by just um, making a statement of the of the variable name itself. In which case, it's pretty prints. But sometimes I'd like to do more than one, and that's where the display comes in 
quite handily. So I can do, for example, run head. Yes. And also, this in the same cell, I do the describe like that. So display is just the short, the, what's actually happening behind the scenes when you just put the, the variable name there. Okay, so now I've imported all these things and I've decided I want the Seaborn style. I'm just gonna show you what the difference is maybe. Let's go back to classic. Um, and then over here, we'll talk about the code in a second. This is classic Matplotlib. You might have uh, seen this somewhere. Well, I mean, you've seen these, these figures. It's inspired by, by uh, MATLAB, which itself is uh, quite a venerable package. Um, and the design is, is, has become quite dated. If I go and I say, well, you know what? Uh, I like the style of 538. I do actually, 538. Control enter to execute that. Shift enter would have actually been better because shift enter will execute and go to the next cell. And now I can control enter this one. And there is now the 538 or inspired by 538 style. Or I can go back to default Seaborn or ggplot. Let's do that again. There we go. Let's just use Seaborn. Okay. So um, in an ideal world, uh, with a slightly newer version of, of Pandas, so I'm interested in my running cadence. Uh, I'm, I, I do a, a bit of barefoot running. And then um, it's important doing really small, quick steps and trying at least to reach a cadence of 180. So that's quite important for me. So in an ideal world, I could have just said run.cad, which is the cadence column, times two, because uh, the, this file specified it as like left, you know, uh, left cadence or right cadence, and we need left, right cadence. And I would have done this, but it turns out there's a bug in current pandas that will then not, and I ran into this, that will not plot the time axis correctly, or it won't show you the time values. So we had, I had to do some, some munging of the data, and what I did is was I just uh, res uh, turned the index into a normal column. So you saw up here at time, it's, a, it's an index that uh, Panas usually uses to look up these rows, but I turned it into just a normal column. And then I went and I uh, replaced the time column with a version of itself where I divided by the time delta for a minute. So I would like to see my time in minutes, not seconds. It's a bit easier. And then I also replaced the cadence column with a version of itself multiplied by two. You can see this is super easy that I, I actually work with these sequences as if they're you know one variable. It's kind of vectorized thinking or vectorized implementation. We're used to this from MATLAB, but it's a really nice way to work. Okay, and then um, it's it's a pandas data frame which has its own plot call. So let's just see what the help for that looks like. Shift tab she will show me that I can specify x and y and kind. So kind is actually by default line. So I didn't have to say that. We can take that out. But I, I do tell it, you know, sometimes it's better to actually just be explicit. It's always better than implicit. Let's just do it like that. X is time. I want time on the, on the x-axis and I want cadence on the y-axis. And then I have an x label of time in minutes and a title. We always need a title. We need axis labels. And then I can just go and plot show. I can just go control enter and there's the map. Okay, so in a normal Jupyter Notebook, this is a feature that it's that it's, it's sort of still in um, being worked on in, um, in Jupyter Lab. I left you a nice long comment up here about that. But usually I can get matplotlib. Uh, there's a, there's, a, there's a, a notebook interface to matplotlib which will make this chart zoomable and pannable. Um, I maybe I should make a short video about that. That's not working yet in a Jupyter Lab, or it is working, but it's still very much in. You know, it's not. It's not that easy to get it running. So I've just stuck with the default for now. We've we, we've had to do uh, enough data munging as it is. Okay, so there's my running cadence, and we can see that at least from about I don't know four minutes in to about thirty four minutes when I get when I got quite tired. This is an an, uh, an eight kilometer run, which uh, at, uh, for me a, a pace slightly higher than I'm used to and then my cadence dropped back down. So that's a big thing why runtime cadence is actually quite important to be able to, to keep your form uh, um, at, a, at a good level. Okay, so then uh, my next thought was, wow, I have latitude and longitude data. I should be able to plot that. I spent some time uh, using the, the pandas, uh, sorry, the matplotlib base map extension. Um, you can use this, but you can see uh, there's my root. And obviously this base map does not have the sort of detail that I require. So we require something, something like Google Maps or, or OpenStreetMap. So in this case, uh, I went searching 
And then I found, I, I'm leaving this code in for you guys just in, uh, and, and ladies, just in case this might be helpful. Um, but then I went and I found a package called Folium, which is quite amazing. Let's just run that. There we go. So Folium can fetch map tiles from OpenStreetMap and a number of other sources. In this case, I chose something else. Um, let's just see what I built here. So what I built here is uh, there's a function. We'll look at the function right now. But it takes that run data and it gets out the um, uh, it gets out the cadence, I think. Let's make, yeah, it gets out the cadence. That's correct. It gets out the cadence and then it maps that cadence to a specific color map. You will see, I think I used this, uh, this uh, oranges color map down here. And then you can see my run starting at lower cadence and then reaching kind of higher cadence here along the beach. And then what I also did is I plunked down these markers. Um, there's the start point. I plunked down these markers with the distance. So that's on my way back, obviously. And the, the, the speed for the one kilometer up to there. So I did this on the way out. One kilometer, see there's no, um, no speed. There should be speed there yet. Sorry, I should fix that code. And then on at least there's a oh wait, there's distance seven kilometers. Let's just see on which direction I went out, like at least according to the GPS. That would be out, yes. So that's at about two kilometers. And then the, one, and then the, the split before that is 4.82. And then this one would be on the way back. And you can see the same sort of data and it was it was amazingly easy to build this sort of this sort of map let's quickly look at the at the code here it was invaluable having the code not in the jupyter lab but in this ide um, uh, and the reason for that being that it's a new for me at least a new package called folium but using something like um, pycharm I can really easy, you know, oops, I can really easily get help by control Q, for example, and then see all the documentation over here, which is super useful. But what I find even more useful is that um, depending on your hotkey, I think I usually use alt, uh, alt period as uh, you know, because I use the Emacs key map, but it's something like, uh, where is it? You'll find usage, usage is also very um, important. Go to declaration. Yes. Okay, so you you might have a different hotkey for that, but that will then jump back into the into the library code where you can look at the code itself um, to figure out you know how to use this. So this this morning, um, I quickly wanted to know how to build those little markers with HTML in them, and using an I full powered IDE like this helped me a great deal. The other nice thing that I've also mentioned is that obviously as I'm working here, for all of the functions that I type spec. Uh, do these type hints, PyCharm will check that I pass the right type or the right type of variable to the correct function. And this obviously helps with keeping errors down. The other very nice thing is obviously version control. So the one, well, that actually brings us to the drawbacks of the drawbacks of, uh, of this notebook format. Okay, right. So there's the end result. You'll get all this code. It's all in the GitHub and, and the lecture notes. Right. Um, so everything is stored in this ipynb file. Let's just see what that looks like. Um, so there's the, the ipynb. Takes a while to load, actually. There we go. Let's just make it a bit bigger. So it's all JSON. It's all very much readable. But then, okay, so that's also understandable that for the binaries you have um, that encode the data, but the code itself, see if there's the code. The code is also packed into JSON string variables. And there's all kinds of metadata in here so that when you commit this into Git and you're trying to sort of analyze the, 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 the diff, it gets really hard to see what somebody did because there's so much that can change in different places. And that's where extracting the code out into a little source file is actually invaluable because there Git really, really uh, shines and it can show you exactly what happened to that code. Okay, so just to summarize what I just said, uh, right over here. Right, so as I, as I mentioned previously, um, 
we know what notebooks are great for but what they're not great for is that they, you know, when you use only notebooks, you can't use your PyCharm or your other IDE, and this really, really speeds up your development. It also gets in the way of building well-structured software because you have snippets of code embedded in these notebook cells between documentation, and that's great for 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 showing the code, but it's not so great for when you're trying to structuring, you're trying to structure your code and build modules and 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 build all architecture. And it's also, um, you could write tests for notebooks and people do so, but obviously using something like PyTest with normal Python code is, is straightforward. It's, it's, it's almost so easy that you have no excuse for not doing it. And finally, as, as I just mentioned, um, effective version control is a bit of an issue. So this is not to say that we should not use notebooks. You can see that these things are incredibly useful. You should use them, but they are one tool in your toolbox. So I've been trying to sort of mitigate these problems with two guidelines. I might add more, but I try to keep notebooks as short as possible. So preferably one experiment. So that already makes a lot of sense that if you're, for example, developing a new, uh, a new prediction model and you're doing experiments, that you will start each new experiment. For example, you're trying a new network topology or you're trying even a completely new model that you make a new notebook of that it's also easier to talk about it's easier to put into git and tell someone to look at that notebook that you built on that day instead of making this really you know um, extensive long notebook with five experiments in there so so keep them short and keep them almost like your your functions in your in your code and the other thing is factor out source code as as you go along so func take functions out this also facilitates this idea of having smaller you know, very much focused notebooks. If your code is factored out, that, that becomes a whole a great deal easier because now you're just calling code from this, um, uh, from this module that you wrote. Right, uh, that about covers it. I hope that you enjoyed that. If you haven't seen this before, I'm sure, well, most people recognize the value of this. Um, you can even uh, turn a notebook into a presentation. So you can turn it into slides and then you can use it when you have to kind of, you know, uh, present your latest results to, uh, to management or to anyone else for that matter, or even have te technical presentations. And as you can see, this combination of uh, being able to run code and then also having documentation and visualizations all interspersed is, uh, is very, very useful. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that. I hope to see you soon in the next me lecture. Goodbye.